Good evening. I, I do actually speak a few words of Ukrainian, but that is not enough to do a presentation. So I will do my best to speak very, very proper English. Um, so my name is Bart. Um, I work for Druid, which is a Finnish company, and um, I am the Amsterdam branch, which is where I live. Um, I've been doing Drupal for the past 10 years, uh, starting at 4.6, so I'm, uh, I'm a little older than I look in terms of Drupal. Um, I've been doing work on Drupal Core, a lot of modules, um, organized events. Uh, I've seen a lot of the community, I've seen a lot of drama, I've seen a lot of very cool things. Um, and um, I visit Lviv a couple times a year um, because I have relatives in Poland right across the border. Like, and my person's grandparents are Ukrainian, something like that. So um, that's why we come here. Um, and Ross has been asking me to come and, uh, and join you for an evening for the past year or so. Um, and I finally couldn't say no. Um, tonight is about fig. Um, this is not something you can eat. Um, it's an organization that has been um, started up a couple of years ago to help bring the PHP community um, because we've all had all these separate projects uh, all written in PHP and none of them was compatible with another, um, which is actually quite shit, as you may know. Um, so that's pretty much what you said. Uh, because if you go to school and you learn programming, um, this is one of the first things that you'll probably learn. Um, this is an acronym um, that is that maybe if you taught yourself to program you don't know. It basically means your mother doesn't use that word. Um, reuse your code. Um, code reuse is good if you have one function, one class, and you can reuse it in a couple of different situations. That is good um, because all your code is in one place. You don't have three pieces of code that do pretty much the same thing, and then if you want to change it, you have to change it in three places. Because that would be duplicate code. Um, and just like in Star Wars, the clone troopers, the duplications, and all kinds of things that end up being really bad, your duplicate code also is will end up being bad for your application because you have to maintain a lot more code, the chances of bugs are a lot higher, um, and you just lose the overview. Can't see what's up anymore because your code is um, Press the button. Uh, Composer, uh, some of you would have maybe heard of this, is um, a package management tool or dependency management tool for PHP. Uh, Pair used to be a very old version of the same concept, um, which was really unuseful for many people. Composer is really just, it's written in PHP, it is a little command line tool that you download you have on your own computer. And just like uh, a package of JSON for node modules, um, you have a composer JSON file in which you specify your project dependencies. And using the command line tool, you can pull them all in very easily. No pair, no obscure software that is outdated. Um, and the really cool thing about composer is that anyone can make a PHP library, a self-contained small PHP package. In package. You can publish it. You don't need any of your own infrastructure. Um, you put it on GitHub. You add the composer file, the JSON file, to your uh, repository. And then on the composer website, you submit your package. You tell the server that there's a package with your name, and you give it the link to your repository. And then everybody else can depend on your package in their composer file. Uh, so this basically means if you have code, you can easily share it with the world. And if someone else has shared code that you like, you can easily pull it into your project. Um, and this was one of the first steps. Um, actually, this composer was developed after Fig started, but this is one of the things that made the PHP world a lot more grown up. Uh, because now we can stop doing the same thing in different ways. Like Drupal can do, doesn't have to do exactly the same thing as Joomla or PHP does, uh, but they can share the underlying components. Um, so this is where FIG comes in, and FIG stands for the Framework Interoperability Group. And interoperability basically means that things work together. Um, so they don't develop software, they develop standards, protocols. Um, and actually, I'm saying they, but um, FIG is, um, it's all open source. Um, you can join it. Um, any one of us can go onto the mailing lists or onto the uh, IRC channel 
and talk with everybody else there. You can help develop new standards. Um, and basically, if we need something, or if we work on a very obscure project and a new standard is proposed, and we see a problem with that, we can point out, okay, we like this new standard, but it will uh, pose a problem for our project. Uh, we have an edge case, but we have a fix for that. You can submit it. Everything is done on GitHub, so we can submit pull requests. Yes, um, this is the one. <laughs> um, but there is a small difference. Everybody can um, join the project and work on it, but there are only a few people who can actually vote on whether a standard will be accepted or not and will be, become an official standard because you can submit a proposal. Um, but only participating of member projects can vote. And Drupal is one of these member projects, and this is Larry Garfield. Um, you, may be rec you may recognize the uh, waistcoat he always wears at Drupal Town when he presents. Um, he does a lot of work for Symphony as well, and he is, on behalf of Drupal, um, he is part of the big voting members. Um, so he is the only one in the Drupal world who can say yes or no to a new stack. And there are many, but there are 20, 30, 40 projects, uh, part of big. Like Joomla, P2P, uh, Pyro CMS, Symphony, Laravel, uh, they all have one person who represents them in big who can vote on behalf of the project. Um, however, if you are a member, uh, if, or if your project is a member of big, that means that you can vote on standards, but you have you are not required to do anything with these standards if they become official. Um, and there are basically two reasons for that. Either if you just disagree, you think it's all one big pile of shit, and you're like, I am not going to use this particular standard because I think it's bad for us. You can do that as a project. Um, but one very practical reason is that if a new standard is introduced, that's all fine, but maybe you just released a new major version of your project. That means if the standard would break backwards compatibility, you cannot just implement it. You have to wait until the next major version, which in case of Drupal is about five years um, currently. By the time Drupal 8 came out, it's been almost five years, or exactly five years um, since Drupal 7. Um, so it's a very long time to wait. So it can take a long time. Drupal, for instance, uh, there's one standard about uh, coding standards. Um, we don't use it because we have our own standard. Um, and changing it during the lifetime um, of Drupal 8, because that standard was released after Drupal 8 was started. Um, we require so many changes that we just decided it's, it's only coding standards. We have our own standards, we're not going to do it now. Maybe we can put line. So, every standard is called a PSR, and PSR stands for PHP Standard Recommendation. Um, it's a standard, but it's also a recommendation, which means you are not required to do it. We recommend you use it, we advise you to do so, but you don't have to do it. It's cool. And every standard has a name, which is PSR dash, and then a number and um, where the X is. Um, and the numbers are arbitrary. They don't mean anything. Uh, basically, the number, um, the last proposed standard, use that number plus one. It's just to identify the standards. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and some of these standards come with code, um, as I'll show you a little later, which kind of said art. And you can just use this code in your project through Composer, like any other PhD. Um, yes. All code and documentation is on GitHub, that URL. Uh, the slides will be online, so you don't have to take pictures if you want to remember what I'm uh, showing you. Um, which means it's all open. Um, you can pull requests, like I said, uh, but everything, the documentation, which is long, long documents of text with all the must and should and must not in them, but also the code files that are interfaces and classes uh, for some of these standards, and they're all on GitHub. Um, so, let's start with the, st the available standards. Um, this is PSR2, um, which it basically includes PSR1, and then a couple of extra things. And this is the coding standard. standard. Um, it tells you how much indentation you need, uh, on which, you know, if you have an if statement, the curly brackets, does it go on the same line, does it go on the next line. Um, we have coding standards for Drupal, which you probably have to used before, uh, or when you run the coder module, it will tell you that your code does not follow the standards. This is a similar thing 
just not for Drupal in specific. Um, this is only this is also the one standard about which there is a lot of discussion because some people are like, oh, we don't want to use tabs for indentation. We want to use spaces for the other way around. So instead of using four spaces, they want two tabs. We can discuss that until the world ends and still not have an answer. Um, anyway, that was the uh, coding standards. This is a really cool one. This is for logging system events. Um, in Drupal 7 and below, we used uh, Watchdog. Um, we use this in Drupal Core now. Um, and this is a really cool one when you build your own custom um, applications, not using Drupal, because there is a package called Monolog. Monolog. Um, and it uses this interface, but it has a lot of pluggable backends. It has a hip check logger, it has a database logger, it has uh, a Slackware logger, it has a file logger, an email logger. And these are all separate classes that all follow this interface. Um, the interface basically has logging methods for different severity levels, like warning, okay, error, emergency. And because they all follow the same protocol, the same interface, you can swap them out. You can say like, oh, um, I'm testing. I want all my errors to be written to a file, even the emergency. But on your production site, um, if something really bad goes wrong, like an emergency, you want to receive an email or maybe even an SMS. And then you use a different logging mechanism. So because they all use the same protocol, you can easily swap them for one another. Uh, PSR4 uh, replaces PSR0, and this might even be the, the coolest of them all because this is class auto -loading. Um, which basically means that we can now have a view if you're already trying to play. We have one class per file, and we have a lot of classes, which means we have a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand extra files in Drupal 8 that when you compare it to Drupal 7. Um, and the cool thing is that when you compare this to Drupal 7, which used a database powered registry, um, which is bad because when your database crashes, you cannot have auto loading in need auto-loading very early on in your application bootstrap. This is all file-based. Um, PHP 5.3 introduced the concept of namespaces, which means that you can have two classes with the same name loaded at the same time, but if they live in a different namespace, they are not technically identical, and they can be loaded together. If you don't have them in a separate namespace, they are in the same namespace or no namespace at all, you get an error because you have two classes with the same name. And using this concept, this standard autoloads your file because every namespace, basically backslash name, backslash name, backslash name, matches to a file directory. And every class name matches a file name, .php. So if you have the namespace, Drupal slash payment slash foo interface, that maps to foo interface of PHP in the Drupal slash payment directory. This is very predictable, which means that you don't need any complex logic like a database to autoload your files. You know where your files should be based on the namespace and class name, and if they're not there, it's the developer's fault. Throw an exception. Um, and if they are there, you have, you have loaded your class without using um, a lot of resources like a database. Um, actually, the, um, what this allows us to do is that if every project follows this standard and every project has an autoloader that also follows this standard, we can use other projects' components in our own project because they can be autoloaded automatically. We don't have to do anything. Um, we just tell, um, we usually use the autoloader that the composer builds for us. Um, and in every composer file, you can say, this namespace maps to this directory. It is all put together, and when you install your dependencies through composer, Composer automatically tells the autoloader, these are the namespaces, these are the directories. You don't have to do anything as a developer to make this work for your application. Same thing goes for Drupal. We don't use Composer directly, but it does work automatically out of the box. The Drupal port tells us the autoloader what to do. All right, um, this is a new one. Um, uh, this is basically the jQuery of HTTP request handling, where jQuery tries to um, work with all the differences in between the different browsers. Um, a lot of HTTP request handling has to be tailored to the kind of server that you're on, because Apache has different environment variables than Nginx or IIS, and uh, frameworks like Symfony try to work around that. 
Also, PHP is quite shit when it comes to handling HTTP requests because you have to deal with global or super global variables like dollar get, dollar post. Um, and if you've ever tried to unit test your code, working with anything in the global states that include super global variables is really bad because you have leakage between tests, you can't isolate, and Symfony abstracts this out. But there are different implementations. Maybe you want um, some Symfony components, but not the Symfony HTTP request handlers. Um, using this interface, we can swap these out as well. We can use the Zen framework HTTP handling with a bunch of Symfony routing things on top because they use the same protocol. Um, and this standard also includes code, namely a bunch of interfaces uh, that represent incoming HTTP requests and outgoing HTTP responses. It doesn't provide classes, so no implementations. That's up to you because you don't need classes for the interoperability. Um, you only need interfaces to know I have an object that has this interface. If you call these methods, I, you don't talk to properties, you just talk to the interface. Check it out. Um, it's not used in Drupal yet. Um, it's starting to be used in Symfony because Symfony already exists and it has an existing implementation. Symfony 3 is going to use this um, and I think um, Drupal 8 will eventually upgrade to Symfony 3 after it's been released. Um, so we are going to have this in about a year, year now. Yes, okay. Um, so as you may have seen, uh, there were a couple of numbers missing. We went from 0, 1, 3, we had two and four, and we had seven. But where are five and six? Yes, these are five is still, these are all still in the draft phase. That means that they are not, uh, that people are still working on them, but they are not official yet. And PSR5 is about documentation. Um, basically, it has evolved from PHP documenter standard. Uh, so the, the add param, the add return, add bar, all these things are included in the standard. And the reason we want to standardize this is if we all use the same location, we can have static parsers, uh, which means we can have a web browser of our code that can read all this documentation. But we can also make analysis tools that check if we properly documented our code or that our functions return the correct variable types that we documented. Um, if it returns a foo interface instead of a bar interface, then a static analyzing tool can tell us about that. Uh, PSR6 is a caching interface, uh, basically a way to make a generic solution for set cache, get cache, clear cache. Um, and cache backends are really a prime example of why you want these interfaces, because if I write a class that needs a cache piece of data, I don't care where it is saved. It's the responsibility of the application developer where that is saved. Database, memory backend, or maybe a null backend to just throw it out and pretend it's cached, but not actually do anything with it which is cool for a local development site. Um, but you want to be able to swap that out. As I, if I write a class, I just want to have a cache backend that I know how to talk to, and I don't care, because I, maybe I write a contributed module, I don't care where it is saved. And then the person building the website, everybody else, decides where this data is stored. This does that, uh, Drupal already does this, but this does it in a very generic way that is not specific. Um, using this, um, if Drupal implements it in the future, somebody can write an AWS caching backend and it will work with Drupal out the box. Because someone can write a JSON file cache, whatever. You can do all kinds of crazy things. You just put it in Drupal, you enable it, and with a minute, within a minute, you have your new caching. Um, free hugs, everybody likes those, which is why on April 1st, uh, April Fool's Day, um, two years ago, I think, someone Post this standard as a joke. Um, it's there. It will be in draft phase forever, probably. Um, but the number has been taken, so the next standard will be PSR9. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, this is really cool stuff. Um, it's never been easier to publish your code and have someone else use it the other way around. And it is really easy to start learning to build new apps outside of Drupal. Um, if you've ever done Drupal 8, building a Symfony application, a small one for fun, is really easy and really quickly done using these tools. Um, it makes you a better generic developer, so you are good at not just Drupal. Um, and it also makes you work a lot faster because all these boring things, like making things work together, you don't have to do anything about it because it already works together. 
Um, these slides will be published there soon after, like, I hope the Wi-Fi works um, after this. Um, yeah, one more back, yes. Um, if you like FIG and their ideas and you want to read more about the standards, that's the official website right there. Um, the code is on GitHub, um, which I showed in an earlier slide. This is the official site for all the official documentation, you know, FAQs and whatnot. This is me. If you want to stop me online and have weird pictures, any questions about the awesome things that I just showed you? Uh, I have one question. Yes. Uh, I say no, uh, Google age first uh, use uh, BSL 0 and then uh, they again use BSL 4. Am I correct? Yes. And uh, you have a lot of experience in Drupal 8 development. I want to ask uh, was it hard to switch from one version of BSL to the other? Okay. Um, small, um, hopefully 140 character explanation. PSR0 is the same thing as PSR4, the auto-loading standard, but it is a little less user-friendly. It requires you, um, the mappings from namespaces to directories um, require a little bit more work. You get deep, because every namespace part maps to a directory, you get very deep directory structures. And with PSR4, it has improved a little bit, uh, which is why you can have less deep directory structures if you want to, uh, which especially if you're cool. Um, I can show you later if you're interested in that. Um, the switch is not difficult to do. Basically, um, if you already got some code using PSR0, moving to PSR4 is usually as simple as removing the top, usually two directories, and moving everything up in the directory tree a little bit. It depends a little bit on your application. This, this is how it works for Drupal. In Drupal, it also includes the rename of the lib directory to the SRC source directory. Those are the only two changes for you. Um, the concept remains the same, the mapping from namespaces to directories. Um, so logically speaking, nothing has to be changed. A few little administrative tasks. Um, if you want, I can show you afterwards during your video. Any more questions? Who's very interested in this and is going to look it up this weekend if they don't forget? <laughs> PHP can actually end as well? What do you, sorry, can you, they have an example? They use for PHP uh, uh, tables using mainstream. You mean for the registry, the auto-loading? Why that is bad? Okay, so why is um, this auto-loading principle is very low level, it only uses the file system and some administrative tasks that you do before you bootstrap your application, you do it once then the autoloader has the map of the namespaces to the directories, which is stored on file. Um, so it's very it's very low level. You only need file access to use this type of autoloader. Um, Drupal 7 used a database powered registry, which had to look up in the database where a reclass was located in which file and then include that file. Um, which in itself is not really bad, but if the database connection fails, that also means that your auto-loading will completely fail. If your error handling is in an include file, you cannot include that because you don't have the database, and so you can't handle the database error and anything fails. Also, it's a little slower because it, it has the additional overhead of having to connect to the database, having to execute a query, um, and because we have a lot more classes in Drupal 8 and many modern PHP projects, and we don't want to have multiple classes in one file, one class in one file. We have a lot of files, and with a database-powered autoloader, you would have to do one query for every class, which is even more than we have to do in Drupal 8. Um, so it becomes extra, extra slow. The so speed and error. Yeah. Are there reference implementations of the standard? Is an example class loader, or is it just like always Symfony? Is the order, in example, are there even other implementation of the class loader? Okay. Like? Um, if there are any, which class loaders are there that follow this standard, mm -hmm. basically? Besides yeah. Symfony. Yeah. yeah. So there's the Symfony class loader, uh, which Drupal used for a while, Drupal 8. Um, and then we switched to the Composer autoloader, because Composer, when you install your dependencies, creates an autoloader for that project. 
I'm not sure if there are any other autoloaders available. Uh, maybe there are. Um, most people I know don't use them because the composer one is really simple. Um, if you want to use an example, I'll use these two. They're very complex because the code needs to be very fast, so it's not the most readable code. Um, however, they follow the interface, so as long as you're, you can make a dummy class loader if you want, um, which can be really slow, just for testing, as long as it works with that interface, um, on this concept of mapping namespaces to directories, it just works. And how everything, how it does everything internally is up to each individual class loader. Um, so I can, yeah, you can try looking at the Composer and Symphony ones. Uh, there are comparisons available about performance. Uh, because I, think, I think the Symphony one is a little more, it used to be a little faster than the Composer uploader. Also more buggy, I think, which is why we switched back to the Composer. Um, but this is not a Drupal thing. This is a generic PHP thing. So a lot of people have benchmarked this, have written blog posts about this. Uh, so this is not my expertise. Definitely look it up. Um, become the expert in this field, write a cool blog post to talk about it next to it. Okay. Alright, I have one thing to give away. I have a very cool t-shirt. Um, I already had beers with Tadas a while ago. So, we had the very first cool question. Do you like a Druid t-shirt? I do. Yeah? Alright. <laughs> Thank you for your question. It's a, it's a medium. It's a medium. Otherwise, you can throw it in the air for someone to catch. Um, thank you for listening, and uh, looking forward to talking to you over here.